Uh, good morning, everyone. This is the Vermont House Commerce and Economic Development Committee. Um, we're meeting this morning to further our discussion on a draft uh, draft bill that uh, Representative Emily Kornheiser brought to us um, dealing with penalty weeks. Um, previous, we had asked uh, Kelly Kazmarski to uh, from Vermont Legal Aid to um, to have a discussion with us. We never made it to her uh, to have that discussion. So she has um, um, come to visit with us again this morning. We appreciate you taking more time to be with us, Kelly. Uh, but we do want to hear um, what um, what you've seen in in this issue of penalty weeks uh, for the unemployment uh, insurance system. Thank you, and good morning, um, Chairman and Committee. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. At Legal Aid, we support uh, Representative Kornheiser's bill. Um, in particular, the elements related to the penalty week provisions. Um, this is something that we at Legal Aid have been um, communicating with the department about um, for some time now. Uh, and we believe that uh, the department's um, current position based on the federal guidance um, that states that when a person is serving penalty weeks, they cannot receive the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance um, that's obviously disadvantaged and seriously hurt many Vermonters during this pandemic. Um, I have multiple stories of clients who um, had an assessment of penalty weeks and an overpayment from the past, sometimes as many as 10 years ago. Um, in many, many of those cases, the overpayment was paid back to the department years ago. Uh, whether by payment plans, um, uh, whether by uh, income tax refunds. Um, and, and so the, the overpayment itself has long been repaid. Fast forward to the pandemic and people have to, in a sense, pay again because they are being forced to um, serve penalty weeks. Um, and in many cases, because of the benefits that people are losing through the service of the penalty weeks, they wind up paying several times the amount of the original overpayment. And for many of these folks, the original overpayment was caused not by fraud, but by some sort of mistake that they, for whatever reason, then um, never appealed uh, the finding of misrepresentation. Um, and I, I have lots of stories that I'd be happy to tell you. I know our time is limited. I also have several clients who would love an opportunity to address the committee directly, if that's something that um, the committee would like to do um, to hear from constituents. Um, so I would love to talk in more detail um, about any aspect of this penalty week um, issue, but I guess I'd love to also hear if you have specific questions. Um, I'm afraid I could just uh, go on uh, rattling about on, <laughs> on this issue and I, I'd rather address specific questions that you all might have. Okay, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Kelly, with respect to the uh... The numbers of people that uh, you said uh, made claims um, uh, where the, you know, they're paying penalties multiple times. Do you have any solid numbers on the, the number of cases um, that you've dealt with or, or in general? Um, well, I can tell you at this point, I think I have right now um, about six stories that I, uh, we just quickly put together as a team uh, last night. Um, I, I know I have several others in my own caseload, um, examples of people who, uh, who really felt um, that there was some sort of misunderstanding or mistake that happened in the past that led to the penalty weeks that they just never appealed. 
Um, so I'm sorry I don't have actual numbers for you. I could probably do a search through our uh, legal aid database to at least give you um, some numbers of the cases that we have dealt with. But of course, there are lots of folks who um, are also struggling with these issues who don't make it to legal aid. So, um, you know, yeah. if you'd like, I could certainly come up with some hard concrete numbers for you. Yeah, I, I, I'd appreciate it. And I think it'd be okay. a good idea to have uh, Cameron Wood um, here to, or if you could reach out to him, he might be able to give you more solid numbers. Sure. Just a mm -hmm. suggestion. Well, I, I believe that, that they did bring us numbers when we started to discuss, have discussions on penalty weeks. And I think it was upwards of 300 people that were mm -hmm. yeah, serving right. penalty weeks during that period. Right. Yes. I remember and, now. And the department, of course, um, in that group, I mean, I am sure that there are um, some cases out there of legitimate situations where uh, fraud uh, was part of the picture. Um, of course, there, there have to be cases. And that number um, that the department was using of 300 plus is, is really all of the cases um, that fit into this category. Um, the, the cases that I'm speaking about are in particular those where we at Legal Aid believe that in fact, um, there really wasn't intentional misrepresentation or failure to disclose. In other words, there wasn't fraud underlying the penalty week findings, um, but really just some mistake. Um, and for whatever reason, that was not addressed in the past. So my subset of cases would be a little smaller than what the department um, talks about as the penalty week cases. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Tom? You're muted. Kelly, uh, I'm just curious in the cases that um, where people were uh, penalized twice or seemingly penalized twice years later, was that an error on the part of the department or was that, is that part of the rules or part of the, the part of the uh, law? Or whatever it, it, it's actually the, I think it, it's more accurately described as the, the way the law plays out. It's not an error. Um, I can give you an example. Um, uh, a client uh, was on a seasonal layoff, had a medical event, um, called back to work and uh, asked the employer to work around the cardiac rehab. The employer asked for a letter from his doctor and the doctor said he should complete rehab before going back to work. Um, this sort of uh, misunderstanding about exactly when he should return to work led to a misrepresentation finding and an overpayment of $3,656 plus a 15% penalty of $549, plus nine penalty weeks. The money was entirely paid back by 2019, and he served four penalty weeks before the virus hit, had to finish the remaining five penalty weeks after losing his job due to COVID. So in addition, so he paid back $4,205 uh, $4, by 2019, which was the overpayment plus the 15% penalty. He had lost four previous weeks of benefits worth about $1,400. And then during COVID, he lost five weeks of PUC plus his weekly benefit amount for a total of $3,000 um, plus uh, 1750 in his weekly benefit amount. So he, we figured that he has paid back the 4205, which was the original overpayment plus the penalty, in addition to um, the 2150 in his weekly benefit amount he would have received plus 3000 in PUC. For, so for a $3,656 overpayment, this client has effectively paid $9,355. And add to that the stress that this client has had to deal with because during the pandemic, of course, he's not been able to find any work. So um, we, we really believe that there might actually be um, a constitutional challenge to this um, scheme because of the uh, provision in the Vermont constitution, I'm, I'm talking the state constitution, about a prohibition against excessive fines. Um, we have not 
researched this yet, um, but this is just something that's come up in discussions. It, it really, and and again, I've got I've got other fact patterns. I can I can send it. I'd be happy to send an email that details these numbers because I know it's a lot to just throw these numbers at you. But um, it's it's really unfair the way this has impacted Vermonters and many people who, again. Um, they really did not commit fraud. And there has not, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of skipping around here, but a, another issue for me um, in watching testimony with the department has been the way the department characterizes the fact-finding interviews that take place before the determinations are issued. Um, the department uh, discusses those as um, fair hearings in which due process is protected and, and claimants are afforded due process. But these are really, this is not the case. These are not fair hearings. The claims adjudicator sends a notice and says, I'm gonna call you at this time. If the claimant is available, gets that notice and, and picks up the phone, great. Then they're involved in, a, in an interview process, which often has um, in the notes accompany that are later um, given to the claimant, the notes are uh, wrong, um, they have mistakes, they're incomplete. Um, so the, I, I question the effectiveness of the claims adjudicators, but then on top of that, many times the claimant never gets the notice for whatever reason, doesn't participate in the fact-finding interview, and the adjudicator then just makes a decision um, based on the information available to him or her. That is not a fair hearing during which the claimant has been given an opportunity to be heard. And that's when the finding of fraud is made, which usually requires a clear and convincing finding. Um, it's usually a higher standard of evidence in, in other contexts when you're talking about fraud. Um, and so we have many examples where a finding of fraud was made and the claimant didn't even appear. Sometimes didn't realize that the fact-finding interview was taking place. Sometimes had a tech issue and couldn't get a call. Um, so we have a serious issue with the process by which people are found to have allegedly committed fraud. Um, and it, it, it really, um, it unfairly uh, penalizes people um, by forcing them to pay back, as, as in that example, um, at least twice, sometimes more than that, the amount of the uh, overpayment itself. Excuse me. Thank you. I'm sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer to your oh, question, you. I apologize. Stephanie? Kelly, thank you. A um, couple questions about your experience. Once the these uh, people have reached the end of their rope and they contacted Vermont Legal Aid, um, I think, I suspect some of these people are the ones who are also contacting their legislators. Yes. Um, and and so what has been your experience in getting these problems resolved with the Department of Labor? Have you mm -hmm. had success? Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, yes. Um, I, I feel that the folks at the Department of Labor are um, genuinely trying to help us. We have established kind of a system uh, with the general counsel, Dirk Anderson. Um, so when we, we have a few advocates at Legal Aid who are uh, working on unemployment cases and we as a team will get together and discuss our caseload. And then oftentimes we reach a point, it, it's, it happens frequently um, where, as you know, I'm sure when your constituents contact you, it's just impossible to tell what's happening with a particular claim. And so in those instances, we email Dirk um, and he often is able to push through claims that are stuck for some administrative error or whatever the issue might be. Um, or he's able to at least get back and tell us, you know, what the issues are. Um, so I feel that the department, the, the people for the most part at the department, at least the people that I've been working with have been very responsive. Um, at this point though, we also, are getting a little frustrated with the fact that um, as a whole, the department still hasn't seemed to figured out these issues. I mean, we're six months into this or more um, and we still have folks who are stuck in adjudications who have not had their uh, initial claim, you know, their initial application even 
responded to yet, um, you know, sometimes for a couple of months and it's, it's getting frustrating. So I guess I would like to distinguish between the people at the department who I feel are genuinely trying to help as much as they can versus the systems and the um, agency itself, which uh, we believe really needs to uh, step it up and um, even do better than it is. So um, it's frustrating, as you know, for the claimants. Sure, certainly. And then I think there's um, a, also a large portion of, of our population who, who know that they can contact a legislator or contact Vermont Legal Aid, and then those who don't understand that they have a resource. Um, That's right. That's absolutely right. As well. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Charlie. And Kelly, I'm sorry I was late um, dealing with a work issue, but uh, you've, you've been working, how, how, I just wanna ask you a few questions. How long have you been involved with uh, claimants uh, in this process? Uh, how, how long have you been in this line of work? Um, probably about three years or so. I've, I've, um, I think I started doing unemployment cases three, three and a half years ago, something like that. So okay. All right. For a good chunk of time before um, COVID hit. All right. Great. So that, that's that's what I had hoped because trying to distinguish between what it was like pre-COVID and what it's like now in COVID because of the volume um, was your experience different before we had this volume of claims than it is now. Absolutely. Um, significantly different. Um, I first of all, I was really the only person at Legal Aid doing any unemployment work. So. Um, I was it and I was able to develop nice relationships with the folks over at labor and when I had a case come in I could just call them up and we would talk and we would work things out I would get documents. Um, that is obviously not possible anymore so that's been a huge change and a problem because there's no, you know, these um, these cases are unique. Well, they're not unique. They're administrative cases. So there's not like an opposing counsel on the other side that you can contact and work out issues with. Um, and because of the volume, um, so that has changed dramatically. Um, and we did not have issues with people having delays, um, not getting responses, not getting hearings. That simply wasn't an issue. If you appealed a decision um, within a few days, you'd get um, a response. A hearing was usually easily scheduled within two or three weeks. We now have folks, we have um, a list that we're developing of several folks who requested an appeal and it's been well over 30 days. Um, and as you may know, by statute, hearings are supposed to be held within 30 days of a, a request um, when an appeal is requested. And, and it's not happening. Um, so uh, there's been significant changes in, in certainly in the process and in the uh, reactions from our clients, the dissatisfaction, the um, frustration, the stress levels um, of not getting benefits. Uh, it, it used to be a pleasure to do unemployment work because people so quickly were getting benefits as opposed to some other uh, benefit programs. Um, so I, I used to enjoy the fact that I could tell my clients, don't worry, they're, they're good, you're gonna get paid quickly. Um, I can't tell them that anymore. And um, people are in major stress about the lack of income and the, the delays in, in the system. Okay, and yeah, some of that's just certainly a function of volume and each case, Absolutely. each one of these cases is complicated. Uh, so, but previous to this with the issue of penalty weeks, you were able to reach some kind of resolution, uh, I think is what I hear you saying more easily uh, because there's just a, that, that lack of volume. I'm wondering if, because what we're looking at is giving the uh, commissioner that, flexibility of delaying any kind of penalty weeks um, so that it it doesn't make them waive uh, totally but defers them during this crisis so mm -hmm. for that standpoint is that going to help meet the needs of your clients i think it would help tremendously i mean i know one of the issues i was watching um testimony the last time when um I think Cameron Wood and Commissioner Harrington were involved and they were. We, there was a discussion about the potential of making that retroactive and the complications that that might, um, if that would be the, the best situation, of course, for Vermonters. We have many people who um, 
are in just dire straits, whether it's facing foreclosure. And, and I know that there's assistance available out there, but we have clients with significant debt. Um, and if, if the deferment were made retroactive, that would significantly help our clients. But um, even if it weren't, that would be a, a, an improvement. Um, interestingly, I was researching this morning um, in New York State, they have done a similar, um, they have a similar situation there where um, they have essentially deferred. They don't have penalty weeks. They have what they call forfeit days. So when a person is um, found to have misrepresented um, or falsely reported information, they're assessed forfeit days. And for each day, a claimant loses 25% of the benefits for that week, mm -hmm. um, up to four days, so up to 100% per week. So if you have five days, for example, you would lose 100% of your benefits the first week and only 25% of your benefits the second week. I don't think there's a limit to the number of days that can be imposed um, for a certain uh, case. Um, it's up to the discretion of the commissioner or the, I think he's called the director in New York state. Um, but the governor in May signed an executive order um, temporarily suspending the application of forfeit days to current UI claims. And that was in effect from May 14th till June 13th. And then in June, the legislature actually enacted legislation so that they by statute suspended the forfeiture days until the end of the COVID-19 state of emergency. And in, in New York, that's going now at least until October 4th. So New York state has figured out a way to defer these penalties um, and you know because they felt it was important. And uh, I guess I would say the same for Vermonters. Um, people desperately need money right now. And it's not like normal times where you could go out and just find another job instead of going on unemployment. Uh, we are still in crisis. We still have not enough jobs for people who need them. And there's still the health issues for people who can't go out and, and, and look for work. Um, so it, it would help tremendously, I think, to defer these. Um, I also, what I also like about the, legis the proposed legislation is that it gives the commissioner the option to waive penalty weeks so that for those cases where a person can show that it was just a mistake, for example, that led to the overpayment way back when, uh, the commissioner could decide to say, okay, yes, I'm gonna waive those. Um, and that, we think that's a great idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Kelly. More questions for Kelly? Zach. Thanks, Frank. Um, and Kelly, for the uh, the part of the legislation asked for um, that the penalty weeks go away after three years. Um, I'm uh, I'm trying to find language that would also, um, you know, since we're deferring for the the time that COVID is taking place, right, does does, uh, would the three years be extended to also include the, the exemptions during COVID? I'm trying to find that language. Hmm. Um, I think the idea was to create sort of a statute of limitations for the penalty weeks um, in a sense so that, uh, right. yeah, so that they would, I, I, I'm not sure. So are you suggesting then that if there's a deferment that the the time period actually be also extended for um... it's yeah so if it's i mean i i agree with the statute of limitations i don't know if three or six years makes sense like um you know i think that it should probably be on par with whatever the statute of limitation is on criminal fraud cases um not having to do with the state mm -hmm. um but yeah i think if if we're creating an exemption during covid that there should the um the the disqualification or the, that statute of limitations reflects that exemption period. I, I, I couldn't see the language in the bill to do that uh, as well. It looks like Damien has his hand up, Mike, so maybe he can answer that question. Yep. Yeah, uh, so there there isn't an extension on the expiration of penalties. Um, to reflect any period of, of deferment or suspension as they called it in, in New York. Um, one, one thing to keep in mind here is, is it's probably best not to think of this as a statute of limitations. 
because mm. um, a statute of limitations is a limitation on the state's ability to pursue a penalty. So for example, the state has a limitation on when it can pursue a fraud penalty. Um, if it discovers it too long after the fact, it, uh, um, or if, it too, if too much time has passed since the fraud occurred, the state can no longer pursue the penalty. Um, what this is, is basically a, a time limitation on the application of the penalty which is similar to, for example, um, uh, if you were to impose like a, a lien on a court order or something like that, you only have so many years to collect it and then it goes away. And so this is something that you face in, back when I was in private practice and did landlord tenant work, this was something where at a certain point, um, if you are trying to collect a court, uh, court ordered award after a certain number of years, you can no longer collect it because it's just, it's lapsed at a certain point. So this is more similar to that. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea basically being that, uh, and I can't remember the time periods for that, but whatever you haven't gotten after X number of years is just written off at that point. Um, and so that that's kind of the idea here where it's however many penalty weeks haven't been served after the way it's written now, three years, but whatever, um, if you move this bill forward, whatever the committee and the legislature sets, that would just be written off at that point. So for example, if I had 26 penalty weeks assessed, which is the maximum, um, and I'd served 18 by the end of three years, the remaining eight would just be written off at that point. And that, that's what it basically does. Um, it doesn't prevent the state from trying to collect um, or trying to impose the penalty. There is different language in the statute that limits the state's ability to um, pursue a, a fraud determination. Um, and I can send that to the committee uh, later on. I don't have that right in front of me. That, that would be helpful, Damien. Um, yep. Uh, Kelly, the, I, I had uh, two other questions. One was, um, do, do you, are any of your clients still experiencing, or do you have any clients that have um, still have unused penalty weeks or is pretty much every, everybody's, they, they do? I believe I, yes. Um, you're right that for the most part, I believe um, at this point, most of the clients, well, uh, certainly many have served the penalty week. So this is really sort of a retroactive issue, if you will, and they are now um, receiving. But I know that there definitely are some people for whom it's still an issue and they're still not in current um, receipt of benefits. Yeah, and I guess it's, um, you know, I, yeah, I would think when we talked to the commissioner earlier this year about this, he had said that by the time we go through this, most of the people that had penalty weeks will have served them because of just the time period. And the, so then it brings up, you know, the, um, the question of, well, if they were able to make it through without this and they've served their penalties and it's done, then, then why not just leave it as it is? My concern is with this, the, the way the bill is written right now is this, um, this, so somebody could commit fraud right now, intentional fraud, um, and they will immediately be able to continue to receive their benefits, uh, unemployment, and there is no penalty for them. And if this goes on for two or three years, they'll never have to serve their penalty weeks. So I'm afraid that a lot of the, the while the intent is to help those that, um, that were wrongfully sort of accused of fraud, I think in the end, this legislation is going to actually, um, actually help out those that do commit intentional fraud to, to get away with it without any real repercussions. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned about that. And, and I'm, and I'm concerned about the application of the law and fraud in general, that this is a white collar crime, essentially, these are people that are trying to defraud the state, and uh, there is no real way to prosecute them. I think that's federally, we're not allowed to actually prosecute them in a court. So this is our only means of actually uh, having any sort of repercussion for somebody that does something wrong. But meanwhile, if you're, if you're a blue collar worker that's, you know, that's, um, that commits fraud, you could go to jail for a year. 
um, you know, against a business. So it's, it doesn't feel like a fair application of the law if we create if we create more exemptions and we also allow for the commissioner to just waive um, people's punishment entirely. Um, so I'm, I, I think the, the, there's some broad overreach on this legislation. I don't think it's, it's going to cause a lot of bureaucracy to go back. And, and I don't even know if we legally can give PUA uh, money to, I mean, I don't know what we can do. <laughs> can we go back and give PUA money to people uh, six months afterwards? I don't know. Um, so I, I would like something more specific to try to address those people. And I don't know what that is, but this is, this is pretty big. Um, this changes quite a bit. I, I definitely understand your concerns. I, I guess I would say in response that um, I, I, first of all, um, I know the department talked a lot about the, uh, the person who defrauded the state of $100,000 through unemployment benefits. And obviously we can all agree that person um, you know, deserves to be punished for what they did, no doubt. But I think that is really an outlier um, and I, I think that I, I feel it, I feel sorry for Vermonters that there seems to be this presumption that claimants are trying to commit fraud. Um, I really don't think that that's the case, based on my experience with the people that I've talked to in the last three and a half years of doing unemployment work. I can think of two people out of hundreds and hundreds of people that I've talked to where I thought. Yeah, they might have committed fraud. The rest of the people, I can honestly say, no, it was not fraud. It was a mistake. It was whatever. It's, they were stressed. They had too much going on. They didn't pay attention to the rules. They just didn't bother to find out what they should have done. That's not fraud, though. That's fraud involves intent. So I guess I would just say I, I understand your concern, and I don't know if there would be some way to tailor the legislation so that it could address your concerns about sort of giving people a, a you know, the, the ability to just, you know, conduct fraud right now and still get their benefits. Um, I see your point, but I just think in reality, it's not something that's, um, that actually, I, I just don't believe it's happening that much. Um, so uh, I, I don't know how to, um, I mean, I guess the other point that I would raise is that, um, there is a provision in the um, in the statutes that allows a, a general civil penalty be, to be assessed for anyone who violates any of the unemployment rules. This is 21 VSA 1373. Um, I mean, maybe that's a tool that could somehow be used uh, instead of penalty weeks, um, you know, to, uh, you know, really use as a stick to, um, uh, dissuade people from committing fraud. Um, it's just a thought. It was, you know, again, it's out there, 21 BSA 1373, general civil penalty that if there's no other penalty assessed, um, that an administrative penalty of up to $5,000 can be um, assessed. So, you know, that's a, that's a thought, um, but I, I see your point. I guess I would just say that um, I don't believe that Vermonters are trying to commit fraud to the degree that many state agencies seem to uh, be concerned about. Yeah, I th and I think um, right now, anyone receiving UI during this COVID crisis, um, if they're committing fraud, they won't be found out right away. Um, unless an investigation happens or somebody um, sends some information in. Um, if they are found, um, I believe they would be cut off from their benefits, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, the agency will go after them to get the money back. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, there is that. Um, Damien, I know you have your hand up. I think you want to weigh in on this a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to point out, um, and I, I, I think Kelly left this out, um, is that the current statute um, that uh, has the, provides for the imposition of penalty weeks states that in the event that the person is not prosecuted under section 1368, which is a false statement to obtain additional benefits, um, 
and penalty provided in section 1373, which is the $5,000 administrative penalty is not imposed, then the person shall be disqualified and shall not be entitled to receive benefits. In other words, they're going to get um, penalty weeks up to 26. Um, so the penalty weeks are provided in the event the department doesn't pursue the, the civil penalty um, for uh, false representation to increase the amount of benefits. Um, so that these, these two penalties are on the books. I don't know the extent to which the department uses the penalty under 1368 and 1373. Um, and if they, if they are using it, I don't know how they draw that line. I just wanted to point out that the statute right now basically says penalty weeks are only imposed if they don't come after you for the $5,000 administrative penalty for the intentional false statement to increase your benefits. Thanks, Damian. Um, Lynn is next, um, just before Lynn gets on, um, takes the floor. I, um, I just want people to realize that number one, we're under um, we're under the gun to get, I, I really want to get something out on penalty weeks. Um, and I think the committee does too. I don't know that we can really weigh in on, um, on the aspect of, you know, after three years, um, mm -hmm. they go away six years. What that's, that's a longer discussion, a longer policy issue that we really need to, um, take a lot, take much more time on. Um, I'm not sure that, um, you know, what we have, we, we may have to may think about doing a whole overhaul of that. Um, mm -hmm. but what we're doing does capture the people that are, um, willfully committing fraud, wanting to defraud the, the trust fund, um, and take consideration people that are making mistakes. And so that's, that's a longer term. I think what, what I'd really like us to focus on right now is penalty weeks during the pandemic? And is there a way that we can craft language that, um, that would automatically um, um, defer those penalty weeks for anyone um, during any type of pandemic um, so that it stays on the books so this doesn't happen again if, if we ever get into a situation where people, uh, businesses are told to close their doors, people are sent home um, and there's, and they need the money. So um, that's, that's how I would like to see it. Um, I'm not sure where the committee is there, but um, the penalty week thing um, is something that we really need to look at next year. So Lynn. Okay, thank you. Um, Kelly, um, I sympathize with your, your circumstances with your clients. Um, as an employer who's been dealing with um, this whole thing with the pandemic, with unemployment, um, what well, the few times maybe it was, I don't know, I've had appeals maybe once or twice out of 40 something years, but the few times it seemed like it took a long time to get to the final decision anyway. I mean, it's not quick. I mean, you would just go on and on and on. Um, so I'm not sure what the statute says for time limits, but it was not quick. It seemed like mm -hmm. the person left sometimes voluntarily, sometimes not so much, but it was a, it was a drawn out process. Um, but the things that have happened since then, uh, it feels like it's a deep, dark hole that everything goes into. Um, I mean, I used to be able to call up and ask questions on what should I do about this and person's going to be, right. you know, they've departed and they would tell me how to fill out the paperwork so it was done properly, et cetera. And if I had a question or some issue, I could call them up and somebody would talk to them. I have tried really hard during the past four months not to go and abuse my position on this committee working on these issues, but um, it's, I've written letters, I've had uh, pages and, you know, whole full page of all sorts of people who worked for us over the past 10 years, it seems like on this list, some of which should be there, some of which shouldn't be there. I did get, I did get um, something from the department that said that someone wasn't entitled to something. It turned out this was someone who I thought was entitled to it. They sent me a thing with a credit on it. Though I don't know exactly how that works, but I wrote him a letter and said, 
you know, I don't think they're defrauding you. I don't think there's any problem with this. You know, why are you taking this away? And I'm not even sure how they took it away or where this person stands because I haven't heard anything back. That was well over a month ago. Mm -hmm. I think maybe they were confused by the way I filled out the paperwork, you know, but it was clearly not, clearly not intended to go right, in. Right. So it's really a deep, dark hole. And I, I appreciate what you're trying to do because I think the employers are the last people that they're really able to um, communicate with, mm -hmm. not just your clients, you know, mm -hmm. and most of us didn't do this willingly. We did this because this was the only way we could survive in many cases. Yeah. But um, as far as I sort of look at these penalty weeks, I don't agree that, I mean, I agree probably 90%, 99% of the people don't try to defraud it but I don't agree that there are no Vermonters defrauding it. I, you're right. Um, I mean, just the embezzlement incidents we've had in the past 10 years right. probably indicate, there's people out there looking to get whatever they sure. can. Sure. Um, it's just a so shame I, that one, that that spoils it for everyone, you know? So yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I do think the federal laws do, re rules do require them to be vigilant more than a lot of other agencies about, certainly more than landlord tenant laws are, yes. are concerned. I think they're, they're charged with being vigilant so that they do yes. not create fraud. And quite frankly, you know, when, when someone defrauds something like the UI fund, we all pay as employers. That's it right. has an impact on everybody because it really, even if it's not that much. Mm -hmm. So my, mm -hmm. my gut feeling is that I'd like to keep something in there for penalty weeks. I don't know if it should be, you know, forgiven. You know, if someone's got a lot, been out doing it for a long time, that's, you know, Maybe they mm -hmm. should be penalized. <laughs> That's my point of view. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I, I understand what you're saying. And and you know, one idea, and again, as Chairman Marcotte said, maybe some issues are going to have to be dealt with with more consideration mm -hmm. later on. And and one idea, you know, maybe the adjudication process needs to change so that there is in fact a fair hearing um, when the issue of fraud comes up um, so that in fact claimants are afforded due process. I mean, maybe that's another way to look at this that, that creates of course another administrative burden for the department to kind of create a new process here that is more fair than the one in place. Cause I really, that's one of my, my biggest issues with the current process is that this adjudication system it really is, um, it's, it's not working right now. Um, for some people, it I think is working well. And I think there are some adjudicators who understand the law, who really do take their job seriously and, and do a good job. But I, I don't think there's enough training. I don't think the adjudicators are, um, uh, that process is just not uh, where it should be for that to uh, be considered a, a true fair hearing. So maybe that's another way to to look at it, because I, 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 you're right, of course, there are people out there who are bad actors. Um, I think it's a small number of people and I think they're ruining it for the majority who are just trying to get by and, and not defraud the state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Kelly, thanks for your testimony today. I sent you a uh, a message in in the chat now i hope you take a look at it and give me a call thank you and to um, zach his question uh, about uh, pua benefits uh, and whether or not they would be repaid retroactively you know i can speak ane anecdotally that you know i have at least three people that contacted me and were able to get um those uh, monies to them and that's all i have to say thanks and certainly there are definitely clients, I mean, the Department of Labor deals with retroactive claims all the time um, and is, is routinely awarding retroactive benefits. Um, so that the concept of doing that is not an issue. And I, and I know uh, people who were denied PUA uh, for whatever reason have gone through appeals and it's been approved and they were retroactively awarded PUA. So, um, I don't think that there is a, um, a problem in and of itself with awarding PUA retroactively. I, I, the, I could see there being an issue with the state creating a new system that didn't exist when PUA came into effect. So Representative Watson, I, see, I understand your concerns about 
whether it's even possible to do this. And I don't know if Damien might have more information about that, but um, I know that retro claims are dealt with all the time, so. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that we're, we're looking at a probably a different issue than claimants um, who through adjudication were found that they should have gotten the benefits. Right. And so they do receive them. Where in this case, um, right now the way the the law, the, the statute is on our books, um, they were not eligible for it. So right. um, I think that's that's a to me a significant difference. And sure. I'd really worry about um, at least um, at least for the PUA um, not looking backwards. Um, and I don't know what that would mean. Um, of course, for, for those people, it, it's just so hard to look backwards on it right now. Um, so I'm thinking looking forward would be, uh, would be our best bet. Um, and I, I do worry about the department's ability to be able to, to be able to go back and, and look at that. And given the issues that you're outlining right now with the adjudication process, um i just don't think that it's wise for us to put more pressure on a department that's having such a difficult time as it is but i do damien i do have a question though um kelly brought up a good point that um after 30 days um if they have not been through adjudication i'm not sure what happens after that and I'm wondering if the governor um, put out an executive order that that um, suspended that those 30 days um, in in the process. I'm not not sure I completely understand the question. The governor did have an order earlier on. I don't think it was actually an executive order, um, but which basically because the department was so backlogged, the state fronted the money or fronted a portion, um, but I, I don't know what happens after 30 days uh, if a claim still hasn't been determined, but I can look into it for you. Um, I think that would be something we should look at. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what happens um, if they haven't had heard, if their claims haven't been heard after 30 days, and if that hasn't been, um, been suspended for during this COVID time, um, I'm just wondering where we're at. So Kelly, may, maybe you can. Uh, as I understand it, the, the statutes require that when a person makes an application for unemployment benefits, the department must respond with a determination promptly. So I don't think there is actually a number of days specified by which they must make the initial determination. The 30 day limit that I was talking about earlier was by statute when a person requests an appeal the hearing is supposed to occur within 30 days and that is not happening in all cases right now. So, sure. um, yeah, but th then I'd like to know what happens after the 30 days, if that hasn't gone through, does, does the, hmm. the claimant automatically win their appeal? No, they just wait for the hearing to be held the, right now. That's what's happening. Then why do we have 30 days then? If that's there's a good no, question. It seems like there should be a penalty on a department if they can't, um, if they can't do it. And I have, I have a list of uh, at least 10 people that we put together last night um, who uh, have been waiting more than 30 days. Um, maybe it's not 10, maybe it's eight, but, um, and we are in touch with the department. I should say that, you know, we do pass those on to Dirk Anderson. And so they are, and again, I think it is a function of just the, the system is overwhelmed and they're gonna get to them as quickly as they can, but, the statute says 30 days, so I don't know. It's, it's, it's one thing, and, and this is where we feel it's been six months now. For the first six months, we could sort of say, okay, Department of Labor, yes, but now, uh, you know, um, we might need to take some sort of more, um, you know, a, a stronger action to insist that they comply with the 30 day. Yeah, um, yeah my uh, understanding is that they are hiring more people for adjudication. 
Mm -hmm. um, but I think like in all things, um, they need to be trained and, and right. much more well-trained than just taking uh, initial claims. So mm -hmm. um, right. unfortunately, it's the, the times we're in right now. Damien? Mm -hmm. I was gonna say under, under section 1348A, it specifically provides that the hearing has to be held within 30 days. The next provision that addresses it beyond that and then says prompt notice um, of the decision has to be given, it doesn't provide um, uh, any sort of um, automatic action if the hearing isn't held within 30 days. Um, and then beyond that, it just basically provides that within 30 days after the initial appeal is heard, you can appeal to the full employment security board. And then within 30 days after that, you can appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, but you're, you're otherwise limited um, there in that there's no, you know, there's, there's no sort of trigger to push those appeals to be held more quickly. I think um, my understanding is that in, in normal times, um, there is a review by the Federal Department of Labor to see that claims are being heard promptly and determined promptly. And, and that's something that the that the State Department of Labor is judged by the, the Federal Department of Labor on. But I with the current volume of claims and so forth, I don't I don't know that there's any um, real standard for them to follow because I think across the country that the uh, various UI or, or employment security um, departments and divisions are, are struggling um, just to keep their heads above water with the number of claims coming in. So um, I don't know, know uh, what options we have or what the practical impact would be um, uh, with respect to those. Well, I, I'm sure if we had some, some kind of a you know, there's a penalty against the department or the, the claimant's claim would be found in favor of the claimant, um, that well, there would probably have been an executive order to suspend that during this time anyway. And I mean, I think we all can understand that. It still doesn't, yeah. it still doesn't um, help those people um, that are trying to get unemployment, get unemployment. So right. it's, it's kind yeah. of a double-edged sword, right? Yeah, the, the problem with making an automatic payout that I can see is that under federal law and state law, the department is, um, is required to recover amounts that were improperly paid to a claimant. So if you pay out the money to someone who is unemployed and then they're later determined not to be eligible, um, you're then basically having to go after them to get that repayment. And we potentially start um, a very similar process to the issue that we've been discussing this morning with Kelly here, where now you have someone who's an overpayment um, and then there's a question of, was it an intentional misrepresentation? And we're, we're back down that road. Um, and so there, even if we're forcing the department's hands here to get the benefits out, there's a potential that it just creates more complications on the other end because the department's required to go after those amounts mm -hmm. under both state and federal law. Um, so I'm not sure what the solution is uh, in the interim. I know uh, when the governor paid out those amounts, it was with the understanding that in some cases, the amounts might be wrongly paid out, but the, the state wasn't going to go after those amounts. Um, I, I would think in, in the case where the state didn't perform their duties um, in, in the, the allowable amount of time, that um, that fault would fall on, on them and not the claimant. And so they may uh, later find that in, uh, not in favor of the claimant and go after the money, but I don't, I don't believe that they could assess penalty weeks because it wasn't the claimant's fault that they received the money. 
Yeah. Um, but so if, if, if you could, that, they would still have to get back the overpayment. Right. If, if maybe, you know, while, while you get your month or so off before bills start coming into you for drafting, <laughs> uh, if you could just start taking a look at the issues that we're bringing up and, and, um, just kind of give us a little report back on what we might be able to do um, when we come back in January. That'd be real helpful. Yeah, I can start putting together some some information on on what we might be able to do, what other states have done. Yeah, that, that, that'd be great. Um, any other questions for Kelly? So I guess, thank you, Kelly. And it was a very good conversation. I guess committee, I, I want to get a feel for where everybody's at. Are you, um, I'm, I'm really wanting to save some of this for January when we come back. Um, Cause those are really deeper discussions on penalty weeks and, and, and the length and all of the, I, I think looking at all of the, all of that, but, I think the issue at hand for us right now is um, can we get something out just dealing with uh, suspending penalty weeks during a pandemic? Um, is everybody good with that? Yep. Okay, I see thumbs and heads bobbing, so. Um, Mike, would that be retroactive or is this uh, just like- I think, I, I mean, I'm thinking going forward, um, I'd love to do it retroactive. I just don't think the department has a capacity to do it. And so, um, Kelly? I just wanted to ad address that point quickly. Um, the department keeps talking about um, only something like a hundred and some odd cases of uh, that are um, currently still stuck. And then I think you mentioned 300 cases going back a few months where people were not getting paid. Um, and, and I mean, because if this were just a deferment of the penalty weeks that were retroactive, it would seem to me that it would, sure, it's obviously going to take some administrative work to make that happen, but it's not like a determination has to be made in each one of those cases. Um, so it's, mm -hmm. I understand there is some administrative burden, but I think because the department is already used to processing retroactive claims um, and that it, it's really more of a math issue uh, when the weeks are just deferred, it's not like any judgment needs to be involved there. I don't think it's is as big of an administrative burden, or at least um, that's my opinion, um, as as it, it may first appear. Um, I think the department does have capability of doing this, um, and I don't think it would take too much for them to process, you know, three hundred and some odd claims of people who, um, you know, were serving penalty weeks during the pandemic. That's that's a question we certainly can ask. Um, mm -hmm. Lynn? Yeah, just to clarify, when you say defer, you mean that it would not be uh, eliminated. It would just be held off until after the pandemic right. period. Yeah. And um, seems to, I, I can't find the language for whatever this bill is or whatever that they may, I assume, will give us some language, but or more language. But what was the number that we were talking about in terms of cost? Is it is there a cost figure to this that we're talking about? For these well, it, it, it'll be a, it'll be a cost to the trust fund. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like I I remember we had a cost mentioned somewhere, but I can't remember. Is that true? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think. Well, we it might be nice. To, it might be nice to know what that is. And it seems like that should be calculable, like a finite amount. That yeah, it seems like that should be something. Not too it's, difficult to figure out. It's going to depend on what each claimant's um, is is uh, what what their um, um, weekly amount is supposed to right. be. So it's going to you know it, it'll take time to understand what that is, but it's I don't see it as being a huge amount mm -hmm. considering the amount of money that's coming out of the trust fund now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so uh, you know I'm I don't the PUA is a whole different issue. I don't no or i don't think we can go back um on the pua but at least 
if we can get them the benefits that they should have gotten while they were serving their penalty. But, and I don't know how that's going to work either. Um, we're going to have to have some discussions with the department. I'm wondering because those people have served their penalty weeks, they're gone for the one. So how do we make that retroactive if they've served them? Hmm. I guess they'd have to be reinstated uh, and sort of like the serving of it uh, is mooted out in effect. In effect, they're going to get the payments, and then they the penalty weeks would be added back on. I guess that's a and good good question. Yeah. And and I don't know if we legally can do that. Mm. Well, I, New York State has managed to defer. Um, you know this. Yeah, but I don't know if they've de de deferred weeks that have already been served. So it's kind of like you had a penalty, you served it, but now we're going to okay. give you the penalty back again. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't. That know. does seem problematic. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. Maybe Charles, uh, Damien can take a look at that and give us some thoughts. Um, Charlie, you're muted. Yeah, I was just going to say that we're not talking about deferring repayment for overpayment situations. Mm. We're talking about deferring just the penalty weeks. Right. Now, so that's, yeah, and that's another, another issue. I think we talked about it last time, last week. Um, there may be a mechanism where, where a certain percentage of, of someone's weekly benefit would be taken to pay back um, any monies that they owe so that they are making payments, but it's not going to be grabbed from them all at once. Right. Exactly. Right. That's a great idea. In Social Security um, overpayments, for example, when someone is on SSI, um, because that's considered like subsistence income, a minimum necessary for survival, the most Social Security can recoup is 10% of that benefit when someone has been overpaid. And I think unemployment benefits are at least somewhat analogous. They are necessary for basic uh, living. So um, that would be a good idea as well to limit the amount to be withheld. And I think probably, I mean, I think the 10% makes a lot of sense to me. I don't know about the committee, but we can start there and work up or work down. Uh, Stephanie. Uh, I wanted to ask how I wanted to ask Kelly if there had already been some cases where you they were resolved within within the Department of Labor and and what they had decided to do about these penalty weeks and perhaps we could use that as a model. Mm. Already um, worked on these cases and they've been resolved and some sort of precedent has already been um, determined within the, the department. I'm actually not aware of a case involving penalty weeks that the department was willing to or was able to resolve. Those cases, if they have resolved, has just been a factor of the um, expiration of the penalty weeks and the benefits then have started to flow. Sometimes there's been an, a glitch and the benefits that should have been paid after service of penalty weeks weren't kicking in for some reason and the department has, a, has been good about getting those through. But I'm not aware of any case where, um, for example, anecdotally, you know, where we were able to negotiate, for example, um, you know, uh, a resolution over the penalty weeks. Um, and as I understand it, the department's really right now not able to do that. That would be one of the things that um, Representative Kornheiser's proposal would empower the department to, uh, you know, waive or reduce um, so that they could uh, take some action, but I, I don't know of any case. The only response I've ever had from the department on these issues is, well, they've only got a few more weeks to serve. They'll start, kick, you know, regular UI will start to kick in in just a couple weeks. And, and usually, you know, time goes by because uh, it just takes too long to talk to anybody. And then they do start to kick in eventually. And at least the client has some income at that point. So, we really haven't been able to resolve this. Um, we thought way back that we were going to, and it seemed like there was some room before that federal guidance came out and the commissioner said that he could not sign the letter that came from the committees. Um, so there, we really haven't had 
any success, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, thank you. I was, I guess, I was under the impression that you had already worked uh, some of these cases through with the Department of Labor and. Um... The cases where there have been um, errors that we have been able to identify, um, they were able to. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific example, like. Um, uh, misreports of wages or, um, uh, I don't know, um, where uh, uh, social security number, I, the, sort of administrative um, glitches that have come up. When the issue has been this person serving penalty weeks, the, re the department's response has been, there's nothing we can do. Thank you. Yeah. There's no ability for the commissioner to waive Penalty right. weeks at this point. Damien, have question or comment? I'm sorry, I didn't realize my hand was still oh, up. Okay. Sorry about that. It's okay. No questions or comments. Okay. I think, do you, uh, so do you have a pretty good flavor of where we'd like to go? If you can craft something, uh, language that would, automatically uh, defer penalty weeks um, during any type of um, pandemic that we've gone through. So it's an emergency that, or a pandemic emergency. I, I, I think we've gotta be careful that um, it, it would only have to be during a time where uh, businesses are ordered to shut down, where people are losing their jobs because of, of those issues. Um, where we would um, we would defer those penalty weeks, and so yep, go ahead. Um, would something work where it's it basically is starting from the effective date of the bill through the whenever the governor lifts the state of emergency? Um, penalty weeks are just deferred until the calendar week after he lifts the state of emergency. Yeah, and but I want to leave something on the books. That, you want to leave something on the books that okay. lives with that lives with this. So if, if something happens like this again, and Lord knows how long um, that people aren't going through the same issue again, that they will, that they'll be taken care of at least with unemployment benefits um, so that they can uh, um, take a little stress off their lives during things like this. Okay. But, uh, the other, the other changes that were proposed in um, Representative Kornheiser's amendment, giving the commissioner the authority to um, suspend or waive penalty weeks, and then the three-year expiration. You want to hold off on those at this point? I think those are those are bigger conversations that we okay. should have in January, um, and and actually even looking at the adjudication process and. Um, some of the things that Kelly has brought up. Um, okay. And I think we're going to be spending a lot of time with you in the next few days. So I think um, I'm wondering if I, I believe committee that we're going to get S352 and S353. And so if we do um, get those today, we'll begin looking at those tomorrow. And I'm just wondering if that can be a vehicle for our UI stuff as well. Um, not just this, but um, the other UI pieces that we were, piece we were looking at. So. <clears throat> you, mean, you mean the part with the trust fund? Yes. Yep. Calculation. Maybe we can put it all in one bill and not have to separate it out. Anything else um, anyone wants to bring up on this? Any more questions for Kelly? Comments? Everybody happy with the direction that we're going on going on this? So yeah. I just want to clarify something. So if we put something in there that says during a state of emergency declared by the governor, um, the results in the economic shutdown, then pen penalty weeks will be deferred until the end of that. Uh, that doesn't give the uh, commissioner any discretion um, to waive it if there isn't a pandemic or isn't a state of emergency. Correct. I think that unless the committee wants to um, put something like that in right now, I'm, I'm just thinking it's 
um, probably a, a conversation that we have when we when we talk about penalty weeks and and the commissioner's abilities. Unless you all want to see that in there, I'm, I'm just not sure about the. This is not a typical occurrence, right? We're not going to see, hopefully, in our lifetimes, um, this type of thing occur again. Um, and do we need to address just the situation now or situation anticipated situations going forward? And that's the only reason why I bring it up. Um, Could we refer directly to COVID? We did this with workers' comp and we, re we referred specifically to the emergency under COVID-19. Maybe that would be able to address Charlie's concerns. Well, so the, the immediate um, piece would be there, there's already language in um, Representative Kornheiser's proposed amendment that would defer defer them until after the current state of emergency, the, co the COVID-19 state of emergency. Um, and I'll modify that because that included the uh, re-imposition of penalty weeks and payment of back benefits. So obviously that's going to need to change to go in the direction that the committee is going in at this point. Um, but so that that's already there. I think what the chair is talking about is putting something else on the book that would also automatically suspend the application of penalty weeks during a period where the governor has declared a state of emergency that includes uh, the ordered closure of businesses um, it during be that the, state of emergency. It wouldn't be the application. It would be a deferment of penalty weeks. Right, so the- uh, They couldn't apply penalty. They, it's not that they can't assess penalty weeks. It, it, they can't apply them. Right, so okay. it, would, it would defer the actual application of them um, to, or the, not the imposition, but the application basically. So you're, if you had 20 penalty weeks on your record, you'd still have those when the state of emergency lifted. It's just during that state of emergency with the closure of businesses. And I think that's a two part thing because for example, um, sometimes the governor declares a state of emergency um, in relation to flooding, but businesses aren't closing and laying off people. Um, so, and it's, you know, so you've got something that's very temporary there and we don't want to have people claiming well you couldn't do penalty weeks that week because there was a flood in in Chittenden County right. um but this is this is different because the governor declared a state of emergency and then with addendum six ordered the closure of a significant portion of businesses across the state which resulted in the spike in unemployment um, that we're all familiar with and so I think that's that's probably the, the two-part test and I'll, I'll work on some language on that over the weekend so that we have it for next week when the committee's ready to start moving language. Um, and I, I imagine that this could just be combined with the other uh, UI trust fund issue yeah. um, there. So whenever I hear from the department on, on their proposed language on that, um, but it, it sounds like those are the two things. And at this point, the commissioner's discretion to suspend or waive the benefits, you're gonna hold off on that. Um, and definitely it sounds like the committee is holding off on this. The, I almost called it the statute of limitations representative <laughs> Watson. You've got it in my head now, but the, Sorry. the sort of um, expiration date on the, the penalty weeks. Um, so, and then that'll be something that I look into um, <laughs> for, for next, uh, next term, along with um, some of the potential ways to address or require the department to address claims more quickly. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that um, we ought to try to, I agree with what Damien just said. I think we should try to, keep it as simple as possible for now. 
we don't have a lot of time. I mean, we're almost halfway through September. We're supposed to be done by the end of September. Uh, I just wanna remind everybody that when I was first here, those first two years, it took us two years plus a summer study committee to finally come up with a grand bargain. This is a complicated subject. We're gonna have a much better idea where the, the trust fund stands in January. We're gonna have a much better idea of where this, this pandemic exists, hopefully seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in January. I mean, it's, it's just a lot of work to do anything with, with these federal regulations. And, you know, a lot of these PUA issues and other issues, you know, the federal government could still come after this money in two years. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what they do. They are very, very oriented toward um, fraud detection and, and risk averse. And they could do, even if we go and try to do something, it, it may not be what the feds want. And so we have to be careful because, you know, that so much of the money is tied up with federal money and so much of the rules and regulations are tied up with federal rules. So we have to be really careful before we start yeah. doing all kinds of stuff that may not, not may not work. And and in fairness to the folks over at Labor, I, I early on in this back in March and April, I was talking with uh, Dirk Anderson, and I know that in within the department there was a strong desire, of course, to try to help Vermonters, but they were they were getting so much pressure from the feds, exactly like you're saying, that if you give out $1 that should not have been given out, you know, there will basically be hell to pay, that we're gonna, we're gonna come after you for that. And so that was very discouraging, I think, for the folks at our Department of Labor, the, the, um, the type of warnings and um, you know, ominous messaging they were getting from the feds. So um, I do understand that pressure is definitely on them, um, which is unfortunate, but there it is. Yep. Okay. So with that, um, I think Damien has everything he needs and you'll find out, um, uh, you'll research the retroactivity um, benefits and that type of thing. Um, I think it's going to be pretty difficult for us to do, but um, we'll wait to hear back from you on that. Um, committee, we are on the floor at two. Um, I imagine the rules will be suspended, so we take up the budget. So there will be uh, our section that's in the budget um, is the $100 million that we're putting towards uh, re recovery and, and other things. Um, so I just want Charlie and Jean to be prepared in case uh, questions arise. Um, all right. See, Charlie's doing his Rocky thing. <clears throat> and um, also, I, I, if if there's any comments that any committee member wants to make on on our section of the budget, um, if there's anything that comes up and you want to weigh in, feel free to weigh in. Don't don't. Um, don't hold anything back. I think we've done a, a pretty good job on this uh, next amount of money that we're putting out and, uh, and uh, anything that uh, you want to weigh in on would be great. Zach? Mike, did, uh, did they keep everything that we asked for or did they make any changes? No changes. Cool, right on. So uh, Kelly, wow. thanks again. Thanks again for- Thank you all.